first of all, hello and welcome to this webinar brought to you today by Sync USA in partnership with Okta. My name is Jason Senemal. I am the Chief Product Officer here at Sync, and I am absolutely delighted and honored to be hosting all of you in attendance and watching this webinar, either live or an on-demand, depending on how you're watching this. The focus of this discussion centers on the dynamic workplace of the future. For a long time, we had been expecting changes in our working environments, but nobody truly expected to have to evolve so suddenly. What started as a steady shift to remote and flexible working obviously suddenly had to change overnight. And this change was in progress and unavoidable, pandemic or not. But exorbitant price increase of metropolitan cities, worldwide rivalry for talent, progress in cloud innovation, millennial, Gen Z workforces, just a few of the factors that moved us towards a workforce with more freedom and flexibility and a new framework being called dynamic work. I am joined by three fantastic thought leaders today who will be sharing their experiences and strategies as they plan for the near and long-term future of their workplace. So joining me, first and foremost, we have Christina Johnson, Chief People Officer at Okta. Hello there, Christina. Hello. Hello, or KJ. Um, we also have Mr. Ross Tucker, the Chief Information Officer at Texas United Corporation. Hello there, Ross. And Mr. Walter Ferrer, Senior Vice President over at Bank of America. Hello, Walter. How are you? Very well, thank you very much. So let's dive right into it. Um, obviously for the live attendees here today, we do want to ensure you have the opportunity to have any questions that you may have answered by our panelists accordingly. So please use that Q&A feature to submit your questions to the panelists throughout, should you have any, and we will make sure that we address them. You can also collaborate with your peers using the chat feature. We love to see people commenting on some of the uh, uh, comments being made by our panelists. And we love seeing people kind of talking to one another and asking one another questions throughout the session as well. So please do that. It's fantastic to see that collaboration when it happens. So we're gonna start off by just kind of setting the scene a little bit here. And um, KJ, as one of the co-hosts of this particular session today, I'm gonna to come to you first. And I'd like to ask you, a little bit about, um, or I, I suppose, ask you to provide an overview of what you guys have been doing to create that dynamic workplace and how some of the infrastructure you had in place prior to the events of 2020 have led to a bit more of a smoother transition as you, as you start planning for the workplace of that future. Yeah, sure, Jason. So we actually began our dynamic work pilot in uh, uh, 2019. In our London office, so we were, you know, who knew the pandemic was going to hit? But because we had a head start there, right? So, and when I say we started a pilot, there were no assigned desks, there were neighborhoods. You would use a mobile app to reserve your space. We were moving away from this one-to-one -one desk because, you know, the important thing what we really realized is as our business and businesses in general are, are growing globally, it's much less critical to maintain that centralized headquarter. Focus, you have to, to adapt to a global decentralized workforce. It also helps us widen our aperture of where we look for talent. We can look anywhere in the world and just make sure they have the right technology stack. So we learned a lot from that test pilot in London. We were able to iterate on some things like, oh, this didn't work, this did. We rolled it out in 2020 with my team in San Francisco and a few other teams, and then the pandemic hit, which accelerated everything. But we we really were, relatively speaking, in a better place than, than many organizations because we had already started down that road. Fantastic, and you mentioned the tech stack there, which we are definitely gonna to be touching on soon and, and uh, how much of an important role that's obviously going to play. Ross, um, we'd love to get your perspective, obviously, you know, global organization. Um, we'd love to understand from your, side of the house, um, how much your kind of existing or pre-existing working environment and policies have given you a platform to evolve efficiently for the future? So, you know, we're a little bit different company. Just a quick overview, uh, Texas United is the parent company of a interstate pipeline company. We're one of the top three salt producers or full purpose salt companies in the world. So we do food grade, we have salt mines. Then we have corporate headquarter type environments as well. So um, mm -hmm. as far as a dynamic workforce, you know, a lot of our 
think we touched on this before, um, our headquarters and our sort of what you would, the white collar office of operations are located in the Southern United States. So we had started to do a combo of what you were referring to as a dynamic workforce. Prior to COVID, we were starting to allow people to do some working from home and have touch space offices rather than you know, traditional office space. Um, then we, for hurricane preparedness, went to a, a full dynamic. In other words, we no longer have desktops. No one in our company has desktops, whether they're in the field, the mines, or in our corporate headquarters. So we had gone fully immersed with video conferencing, soft phones on everybody's machine throughout the enterprise. So when COVID hit, um, what we saw was a change in adoption rate, right? Before it hit, we had all these tools in place. We had about 20% adoption. It was nice to have, people loved the video conferencing. We own our, our own fully immersed video conferencing. We have two data centers. We're a hot site type situation with our own cloud as well as third party cloud. Um, so we saw that adoption rate jump to 100%, right? So now you were asking how has that dynamics changed sort of the application stack if I'm if I understood your question, in prioritizing. Um, so when we were getting into mobile applications and a lot of the mobility, there was a lot of ROI on justification for paper and transportation, these types of things, eliminating the use of documents, doing it all electronically. We, we revisited that stack of projects with COVID and we prioritized it in, in separating our people, right? And I'll give the example, we rolled an app out here recently that wasn't supposed to be now, it was supposed to come later in our project stream um, that allowed our, our technicians in the field at our plants to input data right on spot, um, rather than having to come back and do data entry into a computer in the office. Now the original project, it was lower rank because it wasn't saving paper in the environment and all the things pre-COVID but we changed our ranking priority because we didn't want these people congregating in our offices. So, so that's how COVID has affected us and how, you know, I think adoption rates for technology across the board, we saw 20%, we had these tools deployed for the last five years and we have a 90 to 100% utilization today. So that's, that's the big change. There isn't, I would say the last two, three years, there's no new technology there's just adoption of what was. We've come so much further. Now we can innovate, right? This is, this is the time now to use that adoption rate to innovate new things. But we had a lot of new stuff that people weren't using before. Chip, fantastic. Thank you very, very much. And Walter, Bank of America, just a small company. Yeah. Um, so well, talk and, to and us and a little bit. Of, right. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, me, I mean, Prior to everything, did you first. guys have something? The, yeah, let me go how, back to where, where Christina started and Russ kind of expanded. You know, I think when I think about uh, dynamic workplace, it's, you know, from, from our lens, it's almost an outcome uh, for being committed to achieving excellence in what we do and how we do it. So we are very risk sensitive for obvious reasons. So when we manage employee engagement, for example, and talent risk, having that uh, pursuit, right, of delivering employee engagement that is uh, extremely positive, flexible. So we've been working on different programs that allow us to have talent work remotely, be 100% from home, and providing the infrastructure and the technologies to enable that. The same way we have looking at how do we deliver better experience, not just for our clients and customer and communities, but also for our internal staff and vendors and partners, right? So we're looking at it holistically. And as we pursue excellence, not just in operational excellence terms, but performance, people excellence, we, you know, we're looking at modernizing uh, our facilities, for example, ranging from the financial centers for our customers and communities even access when you think about ADA constraints, uh, all the way to our employees and partners and so on, the way we do business uh, across the globe, right? So that's one key thing that I wanna kind of call out, you know, dynamic workplace, it's not something new for us. Uh, it's been part of the culture and the DNA 
Uh, we respond to the market, we respond to the environment, we respond to our employees' feedback as well. So when you think about millennials and you think about you know, the people that have been uh, an employee for a long time, how they do their work uh, might be a similar function, but it will definitely be uh, at different levels of satisfaction, different levels of engagement, different levels of technical expertise, skill set, and so on, right? So managing risk associated with that put you in a position to start deriving insights to pursue, uh, you know, what that design should look like. So going back a year ago, right, when the pandemic hit, a lot of companies will tell you we accelerated the digital transformation, right? Some people have to be overnight sent back home to work remotely and how do you, you know, ship out many devices, right? To an extent, we never left, right? We still have people in the financial center providing financial services to our cl client and customers. But I would say the majority had to change how they go about doing that work. And if you are familiar with how our CEO, Brian, has, uh, by Monica, has described the crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis, a human crisis. So we've also recognized that in addressing it like that, we needed to provide a lot of flexibility in how we get work done, right? So think about uh, mental health became a very emerging topic as it relates to how that dynamic workplace needed to, to be executed and sustained. You know, we extended uh, development programs to ensure people had um, uh, access to mentors, uh, coaches, uh, so that they could find different ways to cope with a new reality. At the same time, we started planning early how would we? How would the environment look like when we do when we do go back? You know, what constraints do we have? What capacity constraints do we need to consider? What facilities? Uh, at what level of capacity do we bring everybody back? We started, you know, creating homegrown tools. At what point do we pivot to a more strategic approach? Right. So, so I will go back to dynamic workplace being part of your commitment to achieving operational excellence across the board, you know, with your customers, with your employees, with your communities, and with your partners. And it's in responding to those needs and the safety in the workplace, you know, specifically, that a technology becomes an enabler, not so much the solution for, for everything. So I'll, I'll pause there and see if there's any, any questions. That's great, thank you. Um, and uh, KJ, I did want to ask before we kind of move on to the technology stack piece, because a question came in from uh, somebody when they registered for this particular session, asking what the biggest challenge Okta faced was when piloting Dynamic Work back in 2019. Can you give us a little bit of an overview there? What the, the biggest challenge you faced was? So the biggest challenge we faced back in 2019 was, and this was surprising, people were very, very uh, committed and attached to their space. So when they learned they would not have a physical desk anymore, they, they were seriously like, where am I going to put the picture of my dog? What is someone going to, can I, leave, can I leave this here? Is someone going to take it? Right. I mean, things that I honestly wasn't expecting, but it, it was definitely a change management. Uh, and it was helping people get to a place where they understood this isn't something that Okta is doing. It's the way the entire world is moving. Now, being a tech company and being a security in the cloud company, obviously, we're, we're a, a leader in that space. But that was probably the biggest thing. And then on the, you know, on the mechanic side, we had some things like some people had trouble with the mobile badging or some people had trouble, not with the mobile badging, I'm, I'm sorry, some people had trouble making the desk reservations or they would reserve a desk and then not show up. And that was someone's favorite spot <laughs> and lockers and where do people keep their things? So it was really just a kind of a mindset shift for every for everyone, which started with the leadership. But it really did help us as we rolled out, rolled started rolling it out in the U.S. and other locations. Fantastic. And I'm going to stay with you here, KJ, because um, as we move the conversation towards getting the technology infrastructure right, um, so what technologies have you been leveraging to create a dynamic workplace? Yeah, so we were already using Zoom, but so there were a lot of tools that we had in place and our IT team had start, had already um, budgeted and taken into account all of the new technology and the number of new tools and applications and licenses we would use, but Captivo whiteboards, another one of them, we use obviously Slack, we have 
uh, D10 collaboration cards. They're cards that you can move around with like 55 inch screens. So you don't have to be in a Zoom enabled room um, for uh, strictly related to the pandemic. We wanted to try and be as safe as possible. So when you go into a space now, you don't have to push buttons to reserve a room. You don't have to push buttons to start a Zoom. You say, start Zoom meeting, call this person. So lots of voice activated things going on to avoid like as, as much, you know, touch in the office as possible. And we rolled out a, a app that we're calling Atmosphere. We used Moto Labs to help, it, help us with it. Shout out to them. But you can go online and you can see if you want to collaborate with your coworker in Bellevue. You can see what day they plan to be in the office. You can reserve your space. You can open up your smart locker with your phone. You can you don't have to have a badge anymore to get in. Your phone will get you into the offices. So really a, a wireless charging station, something we've always had, but a lot of new technologies now that we're rolling out that we're really excited about. All right, that's awesome. I think it's uh, fantastic, really. I mean, uh, as an experience of a member of the public going to a baseball game recently and seeing how you order food now with your phone and you just scan barcodes and people give you the food. It's it's kind of amazing, really, um, the, the, the innovation that we've seen over the last 12 months, um, whether it was forced or not. Ross, coming back to you here, I'd like to get an understanding, you know, for obviously the IT leaders in the audience, um, how much of a shift you had to make with technology budgets and kind of purchasing priorities to incorporate uh, uh, an increased need for remote hybrid work tools. You're on mute, sorry, Ross. Yeah, trying to be respectful of the other speakers. Um, <laughs> in our particular case, it's been reprioritizing our budget. Because we were already moving to a dynamic workplace, in part because of our geographical location and other initiatives such as hurricanes, um, and we were trying to move into a dynamic workplace. We already, a lot of those costs already sunk and we're following that trend, right? Um, it's really reprioritizing what makes sense for the business. Look, I, I'm gonna digress here and touch back on, on some of the questions we had a few moments ago. We brought in some HR consultants when, when COVID hit and we started talking about, you know, how we bring the workforce back and post COVID, what do we do? And something that came out of that and the pre-COVID when we were starting to move to a more dynamic workforce is that it's not just the technology, it's the psychology. Uh, a lot of our workers that we have to be mindful of their age group, and I'm, you know, let, let's, let's just go put some numbers out there. Sort of the 30 to 60 age group, a big part of our workforce, they're not programmed the same way as some of our millennials that are in that 20 to 30 workforce. And what I'm talking about is you can have all the tools in the world, what we realized, and they're not gonna utilize them like they would old school work methodology. I used the term water cooler talk before. Um, a lot of decisions in our business still today of the management and the collaboration don't take place in a formal setting, such as I, I would call this meeting today, this webinar, a formal setting. Now we have the technology in this webinar to chat and to participate and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. But I'll tell you, there's a certain dynamic age group in our workforce that's not comfortable using those tools to do that. They'll make a decision just in the hallway in front of a coffee pot because they're having a private one-on-one -on -one conversation. There's security aspects. They're afraid that everybody's recording everything, just like we recorded this meeting here today which will include their chats, include everything else. So where am I going with this? It doesn't matter how much we, we feel like, how much money we want to put into the technology, we're going to have to operate as a hybrid organization for some period of time until that workforce changes. Because we know just from looking, we, we, we've been replacing our WebEx, and we were an all Cisco shop, we're very early adopter in the full collaborative suite of WebEx and, and what they, you know, tele, IPCC enterprise. And we've been moving to Teams, Microsoft. We have both now, we, we support both in our network. The millennials, they can blog, they can talk, they can do everything without having a face-to-face -face meeting. And they're extremely comfortable doing so. But that older demographic of workers, no. 
doesn't matter if you train them, doesn't matter. Even after COVID and they've adopted using these tools, there as we've we've done this stair-stepped approach of going back into the office in our office locations, such as the headquarters where I am today. And uh, they're more productive and feel more comfortable. And, and remember, we're talking about culture and keeping our employees happy. They want to be in that office environment to some extent. Now, we've also found that a lot of them that we never thought would change from the work remote model, like having a few days remote, but they still want that ability to come into the office. They still want that ability to have those water cooler talks. So I don't know if any of the others have, have experienced the same thing, but we're looking at, at the psychological side of this now and realizing no matter how fast we go technology wise and no matter what the adoption rate is, there is that human factor that we can't change. That's going to have to come with time. Definitely. I mean, it's a perfect segue to the next area here because the reality is when it comes to technology stack, you know, the options are out there uh, for everyone and everyone's going to make the choices that they feel are best for their organization, you know, Zoom versus Teams, whatever it may be, for example. But the reality is, is the adoption and obviously KJ spoke about this. Her biggest challenge was change management, um, which they went through there. Now, Walter, I'm keen to get a perspective of, again, an extremely large organization. Yeah, I mean, you know, so that's, many, that's not easy. I could go on for hours here, but, but I'll... I'll you know, I like to speak in, in, in three things, right? So I'll, I'll say three things. Uh, you know, number one is, you know, from a change management perspective, it, it's going back to that employee experience, right? Recognizing, you know, your footprint, right? And, and your diversity. And, and, and most people would say that, that, you know, inclusion leads to innovation, right? This is one way that we have been able to, in, as business as usual, being able to incorporate innovation being able to accelerate innovation but at the same time keep people engaged right and this next thing i'm going to say talks about that question that sylvia asked about right so we made it an effort to bring programs to engage people we kicked off an automation challenge so where we uplifted people's skills right in the sense that if you didn't know how to use uh, you know a, a analytics tool uh, uh, or not, or how to automate certain steps of what you're doing, right? Now that you're remote, that may be a constraint, but if you're able to build technology solutions over it, your employee engagement will go up, satisfaction will go up, productivity will go up. At the same time, we're upscaling our workforce. So there's a win-win for us. And in doing so, we make it a challenge so that you're able to cross connect with people that you would not normally team up through a structured project but really in a near term kind of say 90 day, 100 days kind of effort. And all that, all that does from a scalability perspective is really uplift the rate of innovation, the pace of change, the pace of engagement and, and, and ultimately uh, better handle a reality that nobody thought you know, it, it, would be, it would be possible. And then, and then the third one, it's really around you know, how do you sustain uh, how do you quickly respond? So for us, that's one of our strengths. When you think about, we manage everything with a risk um, a radar if, and rigor and discipline. So when you think about whether we're using one of the vendors or the other one, and now we use both, right? So being able to scale up, diversify, build, most, build more value chain from our supplier perspective to be able to offer more, off, more options for an employee. Ross talked about, you know, being able to have that, you know, coffee, you know, coffee station chat, right? Think about if you're an introvert and you're an extrovert, you definitely went through quite different experiences in responding to, to the pandemic. I'll be the first one to admit, I went from printing a hundred pages a day to printing zero, right? Because from a device perspective, you know, we, and, and then also from a risk perspective, what was the exposure then allowing everyone to start printing in personal devices, connecting those devices to our network. So we made a conscious decision, right, to mitigate that by not authorizing, you know, printing as a, as a general direction, right? So what we learned was not only bad behaviors were present left and right, right, but it also helped you start to adjust to a different dynamic, right? And by extension, a different workplace. So when you used to send me a 20 page, 30 page PowerPoint or PDF, and the way I would read it would be 
you know, hit print, make notes, and then, you know, make, you know, put it in my notebook. And then who knows if I'm pivoting into another PowerPoint. Oh no, now I'm going straight from screen to, you know, another window popped up open, right? So it changes in a normal way as you would start to adopt certain changes and adjustments. Uh, so, so I can't print, so I'm forced to treat it in my screen, right? Maybe I need a bigger screen, right? Uh, or dual screen, but at the same time, you're advancing your workforce to be in a ready position as the evolution continues. This is not going to stop, right? To Ross mm -hmm. point, that generational challenge, it's always, if it's not us, it's going to be the next one. You know, our problems will evolve, you know, one generation away. So how do you manage that path? How do you manage, uh, you know, delivering for your customer, accelerating? And then the, the one more thing that I would say is there was a question about what, from a budget perspective, what was the impact, right? So if you've been working on, on a portfolio of innovation, then most likely the impact wouldn't be as drastic for some companies or some other ones. So it's more about fine tuning it and you just continue to execute. Granted, in that execution, you're gonna come up with different fire drills or different fires uh, some are more complex to solve, but that's what drives innovation. That's what drives change as well. So I would think that in the reprioritization of the same amount of dollars, same denominator, you were able to move things, but I wouldn't call out something as something so material that it changed how we did budgeting. It was more about getting better at the discipline, understanding that what we thought was a priority or a factor uh, maybe we should have less weight on it, right? Because now we're dealing with a business continuity uh, event, right? And that puts you in a position to start pursuing other dimensions, so, such as how resilient you are if the event was cyber attack successful, primary and backup data center down, and now you, you can't deposit money for your customers, right? So you start to look at what's the worst of the worst that can happen and start looking at the solutions that you're working on so that you create capabilities that can be not only uh, rinse and reuse, right? But really extending your ability to respond, not just to your stakeholders, right? But to your communities, clients, and ultimately your employees. And Walter, really, uh, it's Ross. I just want to chime in. Excellent the way you articulated that. Our budgets really didn't change because if you've been innovative, you've been looking forward, which is what our job is to do. You should have been on that track already. What this has done is tested our theories and maybe we have prioritized things a little bit. It's been a really good adopt. That adoption was so great. You know, during normal times, that change management uh, that KJ talked about is so difficult back in 19, right? They were forced to do it through, through COVID. So we had a really good test bed there where we could really figure out what the priorities are going forward. You know, like I said, I. I think it's always a hybrid world going forward, whether I'm talking infrastructure, whether in the cloud, you know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in that. Uh, and we just see where it goes, but uh, no, great, great job, Walter. I think you articulated. Appreciate it. Yeah. And, I'll, I'll, and Jason, I'll add one more comment. Um, you know, this pandemic put right in front of every organization, our employees health, right? Mental health and, and so many things. Um, having a simple check-in, virtual coffee, uh, meet me kind of uh, campaign so that we get a chance to uh, share insights or stories. I mean, you know, we, we, we kicked off a campaign around, tell me a story when you went out to get your vaccine, right? So, so people will send pictures, people will send, you know, kind of something that will connect, right? And all that made it uh, uh, from an outcome perspective, it's really make that dynamic workplace even much more efficient. And when we get to play a role in it with each other and with people that we never thought we would interact, the same thing it's from, you know, employee networks, the role of employee networks in enabling the benefits of a dynamic workplace. You know, I don't need someone to look like me to be my mentor, right? So when you think about that perspective, right? Now I'm able to have access to broader programs in which I'll have another avenue to not just up upgrade, if not uplift my own skill set, 
whether it's leadership or technical skill set, but at least I have other um, uh, sources that can help me deal better and ultimately carry over that into the execution of my job, right? So that's the other comment I'll make. Lovely. Excellent stuff. Thank you very, very much both. Um, KJ, one more question around the the, the 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 culture aspect before we kind of close things off with security, because it's important we, we touch on that. But around, I've heard you talk about flexibility and equitable. Um, can you give us a little bit of a, a flavor as kind of what you mean there? Sure. So when we think about, uh, we well, first, first of all, we've said we're remote first. So what that means to us is it's choice. We want everyone to have flexible choice. We do have an, a global mobility team. And after the pan pandemic hit, we said if people want to move, and we had many, many people raise their hand to move primarily out of San Francisco and out of San Jose, we would help support them in that with understanding what that meant for them, what their options were. Um, the, the equitable piece is really something we're still trying to figure out the full breadth of that. But I think one really important thing that we landed on early was compensation. And many, many tech companies, especially, and maybe, maybe just across the board more broadly, we're struggling with, I have someone in San Francisco, they want to move to Tennessee, do I adjust their pay? Right. And conventional wisdom around comp philosophy is you have tier bands, right? And it's how you do your workforce planning and your analytics for budgeting. And so we had initially thought we would be adjusting pay based on our tier bands. It quickly became apparent that's not going to work in this new world, right? And so wherever people move, we're not adjusting their pay down. So that's one way we're trying to be equitable. But the biggest thing we're focusing on right now is culture and whether you're in an office every single day, whether you never set foot in an office or more likely you're some hybrid, how do we make sure you feel connected, which Walter was referring to you and how do you make sure, how do we make sure that it's equitable across that broad spectrum. And we have utilized our partners in technology a lot through a technology called Espressa. It's a dashboard where people can log on. They can get virtual babysitting. They can find something in a certain geo that's having a happy hour or a cook-a-thon or, you know, whatever it may be. We also have really relied um, strongly with Modern Health. They're our employee assistance provider. And we saw almost double the number of people accessing our Modern Health, our, empl our employee assistance provider, because people were stressed, right? And people needed help and people needed uh, you know, everyone had a different situation. And so we were making, we make sure to put those options in front of our employees continually in different ways to know that, no, we can't come to your house and babysit your kids for you, or no, we can't all get back together in person right now, but we're doing everything we can to support you, you know, across the board with technology and different partners. Yeah, one, one common KJ on something you just said that quickly resonated with me. You know, return to office, ultimately, it's a component of your location strategy, given our response to the pandemic, right? So we're, we're remote, we're spread out, and but ultimately gives you an opportunity to refine your location strategy. Where are you going to place a larger presence? You know, do you have access to different talent pools and for what skill set? Is it cyber? Is it communication? Is it marketing? Is it a function that relies more on recent grads, for example, talk about millennials and the next generation and so on. So, you know, from, from a bank perspective, we've been able to integrate the efforts across, right? In terms of when we choose to return someone, making sure we have a purpose in sight, right? And we're executing elements of that location strategy in partnership with obviously real estate, right? And, and our facilities enabling team, onboarding, offboarding, but really HR, we have a functional team or an area called life services, right? That allow us to connect on the soft side of every individual uh, and unique case, right? Independent, where they're gonna go back. And then you also talked about the company's um, ability to offer or expand programs. So one of the great things that, that we were, you know, the recipients of was our, our programs expanded, right? So we recognize that now you have two kids, at least one, even pets at home. Can you do the work at a high performing level, right? And still be able to have the flexibility to, you know, 
take care of the family, right? We always say family first. Well, what does that mean when the middle of a pandemic, when everybody's under the, under the same roof, right? So one of the programs that, that got kicked out for a specific group within the organization was to pay additional dollars to for daycare, for, to have a nanny, basically. And, you know, it used to be capped at a, at a threshold. Well, let's add 20, 30 percent above it. Right. And then also include, uh, you know, other type of, of support systems as well. Um, so I think that was that was one element. When you think about what else happened during the pandemic, we went through an election. We have social unrest. So when you think about dynamic workplace, that piece of the dynamic, it's also the uh, result of the environment. So we have programs that we're having our leaders in small groups having courageous conversations was kind of, you know, the name of the, of, of the forum, right? To talk about what was, you know, going through our employees' mindset in response to those events, right? Very emotional. And, and if you're one of, if you're a member of those underrepresented communities, then that gave you an avenue to, to, to speak up, right? In, a, in, a, in an environment that um, was secure, right? So all of these things is what allow us to be a brand that recognize how dynamic workplace should be and will be independent of are we in the pandemic or not, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's being able to use the resources that we have to be able to project and present our employees a much better experience, much better environment for, for, them, uh, for them to succeed as well. So. Definitely. Well, thank you very much. Well, we've only got like three minutes remaining. And I, I, again, I wanted to, to touch on security here. It's important. Culture is massive. Um, people don't understand that. But obviously, with the whole new experience of working where you want to work from, is it from home? Is it different stages? Is it moving around? Security becomes a major concern, obviously. Um, so uh, with the time we have remaining, because I know we've got a bit of a hard stop here. KJ, I just want to kind of come back to you. Obviously, Okta in this space of security, right? It's where you live and breathe. Talk to us about new security concerns that dynamic workplace creates and how people can look to combat those. Sure, Jason. So I think one of the biggest threats is organizations are rapidly trying to deploy new tools quickly, right? So that they can work. And I think they could turn on best of breed tools like Zoom, Slack, other applications with, without thinking through the security implications of the employees, especially because the problem can be just as much the behaviors of the, of the employees as it is about technology. So I think it's really, really important as you're moving quickly to deploy technology that will help your employees stay connected and stay productive. Think about how that works within your larger federated technology stack. Um, and so, you know, you really, you cannot underestimate the importance now more than ever of moving away from the traditional perimeter focused security strategy and embracing zero trust architectures. And it's not just about the identity. An important thing is it's about the device. Like if we can make sure who you are, do we know what device you're signing in from? So all of those things I think are more important now than ever. And, and something that needs to be obviously on the mind of everyone embracing these new technologies. Certainly. Well, we unfortunately do have a hard stop right now. Um, so that is all we have time for, I'm afraid, folks. But thank you so much. I'd like to welcome the audience and joining me in a virtual round of applause for our three panelists. Some really in, uh, amazing insights there. Clearly, the fundamental area here is around the culture and getting that right. Technology is there. You'll find the technology you need obviously. Um, yes, if you're kind of behind some other people in your roadmap and your strategy to get things implemented, of course, time is of the essence. Get out there, otherwise other organizations going to offer a far more uh, uh, accessible workplace for, for the talent. But the culture piece is important, change management, getting people connected, especially with that generation, that generational gap. A lot of folks stay in their jobs because they love the people they work with and the ability to engage with those individuals and that social element that comes with it. So keeping that top of mind throughout everything, important. Secondly, make sure you're securing it. It's pretty obvious, but it's probably the biggest thing that you need to worry about. And of course, the folks at Okta are there to have a conversation with anyone in the audience who's interested in talking about how they may be able to, able to assist you with that. So um, for myself and everyone on behalf of SYNC, thank you very, very much, panelists. Thank you all the attendees for joining and giving us your time today, wherever you are in the country, really appreciate it. Until the next SYNC session that we see you at, please continue to stay safe, stay secure, and we will see you all very, very soon. Thanks, Jason. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.